So if consistency is key to making behavior change work, then user experience has to be so important, doesn't it? If, if it's important that we make multiple connections and people keep coming back to, sit, to, to talk to us, then we have to be building digital things. We have to be building things that people want to interact with. And that, these days, is really difficult because the bar is really high. You have to build things that feel nicer to interact with. So we start with context. We want to know. Uh, we start quite broad. We want to know about the organization. We want to know about the client. We want to know what, what they want to do, what their purpose is, broadly. What, do, what's, what does success look like for the organization? We want to know how the project sits with that. How does this project sit with the overall goals of the organization? How important is it to them? How does it move them forward? We want to know what the goals of this project are. How do we know if we've been successful? What does success look like? And then we research users. And that slide just reminded me, I, uh, like I said, I let Loz loose on the slide deck. He went away and Googled serious business people and did this entire section based on Google images from serious business people. <laughs> um, so we look at who the target audience, is there more than one type of target user? What are people doing now? What are they using? What stuff, is there something similar that people are using? Something similar to the thing we're building? And what barriers are we up against? So this is probably sounding kind of familiar. This maps really well to the behavior change stuff. Barriers, existing behaviors. Here we can be a bit more specific, so we might look at barriers to using the product that we're, we're making. So it might be technological stuff, it might be access to the internet, that kind of thing. And what do users want? What are their aims and objectives? How can we use that? Is there, you know, what can we use to encourage them to overcome the barriers to use? So once we've researched and workshopped and gathered all this information, it's time to come up with some ways to solve the problem. What can we offer users? How can we work with their needs and wants? Can we build in things that make it worthwhile for users? Bring their, for, make it worthwhile for users to do things like bring their friends into it and expand the audience. Can we use gamification? Can we, what about giving people things to collect, for example, or a way to build an identity on our platform that they can then share? Can we use our relationships with other, with other organizations to help? And work around the barriers, so the barriers that we've identified, use all that stuff to work around them. So next we can start to develop some design principles. And this is a really good way to establish a shared understanding. If you're working in a, a, even a small team, but if you're working with a client, you've usually, you've usually got a client team, you've got your team, you want to make sure that you're all on the same page. Everybody understands what the goals are, what the values are, and this is a really good opportunity. Design, establishing design principles is a really good opportunity to do that, having done this research and strategy work. They work best when they're short and specific. You want to be, you want to be able to use them to help make design decisions to help the whole team do that throughout the process. So this is the first three of Facebook's design principles. Our design needs to work for everyone, every culture, every language, every device, every stage of life. Which is lovely, but how does that help us make a design decision? It doesn't help. Uh, this, on the other hand, is the, the first three design principles for Windows 7. Reduce concepts to increase confidence. Small things matter, good and bad. Solve distractions, not discoverability. Those. I can see how you'd use those to solve design problems. If you've got a bunch of possible things that the user can do, how do we decide, do we, do we have them all on show? No, we don't, because we reduce concepts to increase confidence. If we've got, if we want to, do we want to have pop-up notifications that let users know about features they haven't used yet in the application? No, because we solve distractions, not discoverability. These tell us about how we can make design decisions. Test them against real scenarios. So take, go out and find things that are like, that are similar to the thing that we're building and test, test the, uh, the key workflows. Work through some things and see how your designed principles might have affected the things that you're looking at. And they shouldn't be set in stone because if you, if you try and write design principles for a project that will last throughout the whole project, you're probably going to come up with quite generic ones because you, want, because you, you expect things to change. So don't worry if they change. Make them specific and let them evolve. So the next thing we do is we start to scope this thing out. So we've done all this strategy work. We've got our design principles. Um, we know kind of broadly how we're going to approach the problem. What features do we need? What features do we need to build to implement our strategy? If, for example, users are going to earn points, if we're going to award points to encourage users to do certain things, 
do users need to be able to see how many points they have? Is that a feature we need? Will users need to be able to log the behaviors that earn them points? Is that a feature that we need? So we make a list. We make a list of things that we're going to have to be able to do. And we tend to break these into three categories. We have must have. These are the things that define the minimum viable product. These define what we can't launch without because it would be broken if it didn't have them. Should have. So these are things that um, should be there at launch because they enhance the product in ways that we think have enough value to warrant the extra time and budget. If they're not there, if something goes wrong and we want to launch on time, we can drop them. They're should haves, not must haves. Nice to have are things that aren't going to happen in this iteration. They will, we'll put them on a list, put them away, and maybe come back if we do another phase of development. A really good way to start thinking about features at this point is to frame them in terms of users and frame them in terms of user stories, which look something like this. I'm a something, and I want to do this. So for example, I'm a potential cyclist, and I want to know how to fix a puncture, because I've got a bike in the shed, um, but it's unusable at the moment, which is great but it can be improved with this. And this is really important because it makes you assess the value of the thing that you're, of the feature that you're implementing, that you're thinking about. So for example, I'm a potential cyclist and I want to know how to fix a puncture because then I can cycle to work tomorrow. That tells us whether or not it fits in with the goals of our project. Structure and workflows. Next, we organize things. We start to organize that stuff. So we've got this big list of features and information and stuff that we, this thing needs to have. Um, how do we organize that stuff? So we do things like create a site map that starts to tell us where things are in relation to each other, um, map out key user journeys, so that tells us how the, user, how the user will move through the key things that we want them to do within the, the website or the application. And we check these against the user stories that we wrote in the last step. So those key user stories, we check that the journeys we're mapping out fit with those. The next step is Wireframing, which is a funny one for us. Um, Loz hates it. A lot of the design, in fact, all of the designers in our studio hate wireframing, and there's a good reason for that. It's not much use for design. It's great for learning. It's an information gathering tool, but as a design tool, it's terrible. And it's terrible because a bunch of grey boxes on the screen is not a good way to start a fun thing that you want to interact with, and. Also, there's no reason, I don't think, to, to separate the design of layout and all the other important stuff like color, weight, type, all that. There's, you know, why, would you, why would you design a layout first and then layer that stuff onto it? So for me, wireframes are great for gathering information, great for prioritizing things and, and having some visual way to work out um, how things might sit together. But after you've done that, I think you should ditch it and then start the design from scratch. It shouldn't affect the way that you design a layout. And the next thing, the fun part, designing <coughs> the screens and the user interfaces. Everything that comes before this stuff is necessary. Um, we have to do it. We have to make sure that we've covered the bases. We have to know, make sure that the thing we're building meets the client's needs. It, it meets the needs of the project. But for us, this is the important bit, the, the user interface, the stuff that people interact with. Um, because that's, that's what has the impact. That's what people connect with. So we put the rest of the process behind us. It's there. We've done it. We know it's in our heads. It's documented. Um, and it will inform the design process. But we don't get caught up in it. We don't let it dictate what we do. Because we need to be creative. We need to be imaginative. So we break, we break those steps into three broad areas. The first one is research, so user and uh, context stuff. We try and make sure that each of these three sections, we've finished one of them before we move on to the next. So we want to finish the research before we move on to the planning stage where we do strategy and design principles. We want to have those in place by the time we move on to the design phase, which covers scope, uh, structure and workflows, wireframes, look and feel. The reason we don't do that for each step is that in this design phase, the scope, the structure and workflows, the wireframes, the look and feel, they can move around a lot as you design. Things change. Digital products tend to be big with lots of moving parts. You learn stuff as you, as you design them. So we don't set that stuff in stone. We let it move. And the other, the other really important thing about this stuff is that it shouldn't just be the UX person or the design person who gets this information, who is involved in this process even. It should be the people who are making the stuff too, developers. Um, 
developers, for example, make tiny design decisions all the time. Um, there's no way that a designer can give you, in, apart from the, the most simple website, for most websites, there's no way that a designer can give a developer everything that they need to know about how it should look and feel. So developers are constantly doing things like coming up with hover states for things or the way that a thing pops up or something like that, T these tiny little things. So everybody who touches the project, everybody who has some impact on what it feels like should have this information, should have gone through this process. And don't get bogged down with the process. So it's a tool. It's, it's not, you know, it's a, on, a, on a project by project basis, we can pick things out of this uh, and decide to use them or not. We, we make sure we cover all those steps, but sometimes that's an afternoon meeting with a client. Sometimes it's weeks and weeks of workshops. It varies. 